many years ago, when uh, this is back a long time now, when I was in the Harding Graduate School of Religion, which is now called the Harding School of Theology, there was a Navy chaplain who spoke during uh, one of our chapel services. He spoke there one day, and he was trying to recruit students for the chaplaincy, so that's, that's why he was there speaking. And he told a story about a young black preacher who was preaching his first sermon at his very first congregation. And it was a black congregation, and there was a lot of interaction between the members and the preacher. So as he was warming to his topic, he declared, I'm going to take you back before the time of the apostles. And you had a number of people in the group saying, go on back. He said, I'm going to take you back before the time of Moses. And more people there, go on back. He said, I'm going to take you back before the time of Father Abraham. More people now, go on back. And he's really in a rhythm now. I'm going to take you back before the time of Adam. Now almost the entire congregation, go on back. And he got caught up in the moment. He shouted, I'm going to take you back before the time of God. <laughs> Dead silence. <laughs> this old woman in the front row tapped her cane. She said, we know you're lying now, but go on back. <laughs> well, I'm just going to go back to the time of David this afternoon. David, a shepherd and the youngest of Jesse's eight sons, he's, he was anointed as King Saul's successor by the prophet Samuel. Now you may recall that when Samuel saw Jesse's oldest son, Eliab, he thought to himself, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to him, do not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now that tells you something about David's heart. In fact, Samuel had earlier said to King Saul, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. You, of course, will recall the time in David's youth when he visited his brothers who were members of Saul's army as they were facing off against the Philistines. And David went up front to the battle lines and he saw Goliath, this psychotic giant, step out from the Philistine side and shout his usual defiance. Well, the Israelites, they ran from Goliath in fear. And David saw this, this young boy. He saw this as a disgrace on Israel, and he asked, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now this got back to Saul, who sent for David. And when David said to Saul that he would fight Goliath, Saul said, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. And he's been a fighting man from his youth. And David told Saul that he had protected his sheep from a lion and a bear. And he said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now that's faith. Amen. See, that's faith. And it was a faith that went beyond mere words. David went against Goliath with only a sling and five smooth stones. And when Goliath, he gets close enough and Goliath sees that he's only a boy, he was insulted. That they would dare to send out this boy to fight the great warrior of the Philistines. And he said, come here and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David responded, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. 
This day, the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. <laughs> and of course, that's precisely what he did. Now in keeping with the anointing he'd received from Samuel, David became king. First over Judah and then over all of Israel. He was given military victory after military victory. He captured Jerusalem, which seemed impossible. And he established Jerusalem as his capital. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God through the prophet Nathan even promised David his family, his descendants, would rule forever. That there would be an eternal Davidic dynasty. And David was just completely awed by all that God had done for him, by how richly God had blessed him. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18, David prays, Who am I, O sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? Now you might think that someone like this, someone who really had faith, someone who really loved the Lord, could never get to the point where he could sin deliberately and egregiously. I mean, you could understand lapses of control and that kind of thing, but not a premeditated defiance of God. Not something shockingly wicked. See, we tend to think that people who act like that, act like that they had no real faith. They were pretenders. Or they had a faith that was somehow defective. But you know the story from 2 Samuel chapter 11. Before long, this great man of faith was committing adultery and he was having the woman's husband murdered to cover it up. I mean, it just, it just leaves you completely dumbfounded. How in the world could that be? How could this man who walked so closely with God, who'd been blessed so richly by God, turn around and disobey God so flagrantly and bring reproach on him. How could he treat the God of Israel with such disrespect in the eyes of the world? Now there's certainly a lesson here about the power of sin. There is a lesson there. It works subtly within a person's heart to pull him from God, one cannot afford to be complacent in the struggle against sin. There is a war going on. There is a war. We cannot be complacent in the struggle against sin. In Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, we must put on the full armor of God. So that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So there is a lesson here about the power of sin. But the power of sin is not my focus this afternoon. What I want you to see is that your spiritual life is not defined by your failures. The fact you fell under the power of sin, the fact you did shameful things, does not mean that's who you really are. It doesn't mean that's the true you. That the person of faith was a fraud. It doesn't mean that you were a phony who all along had only been pretending to have faith in Christ. That is precisely what the enemy wants you to believe so he can go on whispering, be true to yourself. Be real. Stop this charade. You're not a person of faith. Why spend the rest of your life pretending, living a lie? <clears throat> Give in to who you really are. That's what he wants you to believe. You see, it may be that you're a person of real faith. Even a person of great faith. 
who simply has fallen into the trap of the devil, who's been deceived and drawn from the path. In other words, sin may be distorting or obscuring who you really are rather than revealing who you really are. That's important to grasp. Well, that certainly was true in David's case. God did not define David's spiritual life by his failures. David's sins, as shocking as they were, they were lapses of a devout heart, not a representation of who he really was. You look what the Spirit says about David's life after he's dead. Look what the Spirit of God says back on David's life. The Spirit's assessment of his life. 1 Kings 11, 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. 1 Kings 15, 3. Abijah committed all the sins his father had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father, his forefather had been. Hebrews 11.32 And now what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, they refer to since we are surrounded by what? By such a great cloud of witnesses. What is the assessment of David's life? Of course, Jesus is called the son of David. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. He describes himself as the offspring of David. And he's given the throne of his father, David. David was a man of great faith through whom God did great things despite his egregious failure, despite... His shameful lapse. You look at David's heart not long before his death, as revealed in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. In addition to all that David had provided for the temple officially, the temple that would ultimately be built by Solomon, he gave literally tons of gold and silver from his own wealth. And this inspired other leaders to do likewise. Verse 9 of 1 Chronicles 29 says, The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. Listen to David in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10. Starting in verse 10. Listen to what David has to say. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and, are, and, and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart. I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. And when you listen to what is in David's heart and the kind of person that David is, you see the truth of David's heart. The truth of his heart was revealed 
Not by his sin, but by his repentance. When the prophet Nathan came to him in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and through that parable, which is by the way the, uh, the use of parables, when by that parable he stripped away whatever rationalizations for sin that David had concocted. And we are masters at that. So he stripped away whatever rationalizations for his sin David had built up in his mind. When he did that, David said, I have sinned against the Lord. And the depth of his sorrow, it's revealed in Psalm 51, which is traditionally... It's, it's assigned to this time in David's life to use Paul's categories. From 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8-11, through 11, David's sorrow was not a worldly sorrow. See, David wasn't sorry simply for having been caught and having his sin be exposed before the world. No, David's sorrow was a godly sorrow. He was sorry for how he had treated the glorious God of Israel, how he had treated the one who had done so much for him, and that sorrow led to genuine repentance. Psalm 51. David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Have you ever felt that way? You see, felt that... Ah, how could I do that? That's what David is feeling. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you've broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. See, people of great faith, have been people of great failure. The test of faith is not whether it fails, but how it responds to that failure. God does not define your spiritual life by your failure, so neither should you. You see, if there is genuine repentance, if there is a heart-level commitment to live obediently from that point forward, the sin is forgotten. Even sins as grievous as David's. Now there may be consequences from the sin that you'll have to deal with, as David did. But don't think that you have been demoted by God, that you've become a person that God merely tolerates rather than uses. God has and he continues to do great things through people of great failure. And do not let the enemy convince you otherwise because that's what he wants to do. You just get up and you keep going. Amen. Okay? That's that the enemy wants you to think otherwise. Now I've been talking to Christians, to those who've been baptized into Christ. Now if you're not a Christian, 
We always, this is kind of our tradition, not only ours, but I think a number of places, have something similar. And what we would like to do is give you an opportunity if you think that we can help you. If you're not a Christian and you think we can help you overcome whatever obstacles are keeping you from a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we would love to do that. And so, this is a convenient time when we sing this song, you come up and let me know that. But whether you're a Christian or not, if you wish to request prayers from the group, or if you have need of, of help of any other kind, you also come, please, while we sing.